And welcome to another episode of Thoughts of the Roundtable with me, Matt Rebar. And me, Paul Lux. And in case you missed it, I dropped my tarotine experience special last week, where I basically, for the first time ever, read tarot cards for people. So if you want to check that out, that's up right now. And I know, Paul, you're working on a couple interviews, hopefully for later this month or next month. So that's yes, exciting. yes, yes. It is extremely hard with um, COVID and, you know, the uh, everyone's on a different mic, like 20 miles away from you. So it makes it a little bit more difficult, but we'll get there. And we both just finished uh, finals week, right? Yes, yes. I'm doing a little certificate program. It's not as in-depth in as yours. I'm doing a little certificate on how to do web stuff. So just kind of learn a little bit more stuff. But you're like in doing a whole creative endeavor. <laughs> yeah, so I finished my first semester of grad school, and I did 10 credits, four Congrats classes, to you, by the way. four A's. And so what's fun about it is, A, I'm one-third done, because it's only 30 credits. Which Very is nice. I know, right? But then, two, you know, this was my best semester ever. And I think what I feel good about it is, like, I've always felt, like, pretty good. But, like, my best semester after this one, like, I had one where I got, like, a 3.5 for the semester. And it's, like, I got, like, three A's, four A's maybe. And it was, like, a B and a C plus in Spanish. And, like, that's, like, my second best semester ever. But it goes to show you, you know, like, if you're doing what you like or you're doing what you're good at, like, getting those A's. Like, I was challenged for sure, you know, and I worked really hard for it. But, like... I enjoyed it. Like, I genuinely loved the classes that I took. Sometimes it feels like school, like, literally never ends, too. Like, when I remember when I graduated from high school, I had the thought in my head, like, I just got to do a little bit of college and it'll be done forever. And then I graduated with my bachelor's in three years. I'm like, oh, I got my bachelor's degree. I'm done with school forever. And then I went and got my master's. And I finished my master's. Like, oh, I'm done with school forever. Now I'm in a certificate program. <laughs> it, like, literally never ends. I got to tell you, though, I've already been kind of, like, looking at PhD programs a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> in what? Like, in what would you do? Because you're more so, on the creative side. I don't really know a PhD on the creative side. Here's kind of where I'm at. Uh, sociology has always been my academic love, for sure. Mm -hmm. So I've considered doing the doctorate in sociology. But, you know, it also, like you know, communications is like a strength of mine, but like academically, I don't love communications. I like communications for the creative. So I, I also thought about creative writing as a PhD because of all my writing experience. Like, I don't know. I'm looking, um, the biggest, Dr. Thing, Matt. the problem. Yeah. Right. Dr. Dr. Matthew. But the biggest problem is, you know, finding on like, cause like a lot of colleges online and then there's a lot of graduate programs that are online, not a lot of PhD programs that are online. So, like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But I think I'm just trying to, like, prepare myself for, like, okay, if not now, maybe in my 30s or, you know, in my 40s. Because, like, I definitely want to do a doctorate. It's just kind of like, I don't know. I'm just investigating a little bit. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. I almost did. Um, I mean, when I went, I got a traditional master's degree from Cleveland State. And I was going to move on to um, a PhD program. And, um I like looked at schools. I took the GRE, which is like an absolute nightmare. I did all that stuff. And then I ended up never applying to any PhD programs just because it was, it just didn't really seem worth it in the communication mm -hmm. field, to be totally honest, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to teach. And that was like basically the only option, like really in that, yeah. field, in that direction. So I don't know if you agree. I don't know if you agree with me. I just feel like communications, like, I don't know, like academically, it's not like a strong academic subject in the sense of I disagree of like, with that. Really? Mm -hmm. I, I think like creatively and like the journalism and the media, maybe interpersonal, but like, I don't know. I just feel like the academic element of communications, it's better strengthened in other forms of academia. Mm, I, I would actually, I would actually disagree with that. My, my favorite was interpersonal. And I think just so much can come out from the research of it that, um, I think it's really important. I think it's looked over at times and especially with, you know, how things are today with the media and journalism and stuff. And that a lot of, you know, sociology things that come out of that, which is tied directly to communication. So I see, I mean, and I feel like sociology does a better job at those interpersonal and psychology at those interpersonal. Well, I mean, that's, that's, you know, a difference without a distinction at that point in a way. Yeah. I mean, communication is, is a core fundamental of some, you know, um, psychology and some sociology stuff. I mean, that's, you know, a core fundament of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I, I think people lump 
communication into this like the field into just this weird you know pot of i don't know crazy sociologist but that's really not what it is <laughs> I, I just think, I don't know, I've always loved, like, this comes from a guy who, I mean, my master's is in digital storytelling, which is, you know, a form of communications, you know, my undergraduate's in communications, and, like, for me, that's perfect, right? Like, I, I didn't do communications because I was like, I don't know what to do, I'm going to do communications. See, that's but, the other thing that people always say, I hate that, too. Yeah. It's like, they think people who do the communication majors at the dunces, well, that's not true at all. Like, you and no. I generally love that stuff, so. Yeah, I, that's the thing. Sure, do people jump into it because... They, they want to do, they think, oh, I don't want to do business. I want to do like, whatever, maybe. I, I, I got to say one thing. Go you for know, it. You know what the class, I loved this class, but this class is the stuff that weeded out the people who were like that, who thought it was just going to be an easy, you know, degree or whatever mm-hmm. from the people actually like doing it. And it was the public speaking courses. And I <laughs> loved, I loved doing those. And because public speaking doesn't bother me literally at all. I was on the radio for years. You know, it just doesn't phase me. It never did. But that was the one. I remember that being the class. Like, you could tell that was the line in the sand for the people who were there for, like, they liked the major and the people who were there just to get that major. And, like, man, some people sweated that class out. (laughs) What's funny is for my undergraduate, the entry level, like, to get into, like, you're basically your base level was Speech 101. Mm -hmm. And it was a core curriculum class. But then that was, like, basically, like, you had to take Speech 101 before you took, like, any other communication class. Um, and I remember loving it. And I actually, <laughs> my third and last speech, I feel like she gave me an A plus on the paper. Like she literally wrote A plus, which, you know, anyone who knows, <laughs> there's no such thing as an A plus. <laughs> A's. But um, no, I totally agree with you. Speech was, for you and I, it comes really intrinsically and naturally. Like, you know, for my business class that I had to do, my best grade in the whole class was the, p- the pitch presentation, which makes sense because that's like one of nice one. Strength. One of the hardest things I ever had to do, though, and this one made, like, I think I'm a pretty good public speaker, and this one made even me sweat, and it was the most ingenious test ever. It was a, I mean, we knew this was coming. We had to figure out a way to prepare for it, but we we were all um, fake spokespersons for a company, okay? <laughs> and you would get the company. So you knew what company, you're like, okay, so you're um, Nestle your um i don't know rotor rooter something like that just you would get a company so you knew weeks in advance what your company was but you didn't know the situation like we had you went up there and it was like you were holding a press conference and then they presented you a situation like this happened with your company this lawsuit happened and you had 60 seconds to prepare for it and i remember one the most brutal one was a guy who he was a superintendent of a school district Mm -hmm. and the thing and he had 60 seconds to prepare for this is that one of his teachers got arrested for having sex with one of the students and, oh, he, had, and no. he had to do and he had he had to do the press conference for that we he had to take questions on that and try to like navigate his way through it and it was the most brutal thing i've ever seen in my life see i like the concept but in that case like you really have to be on top of your game to handle that was the like, hardest let one me prepare for 60 seconds you know that was the hardest Jesus. one. And, and the the worst thing was that the, the people who were asking questions was the rest of the class. Like we got to ask him the questions. <laughs> See, I like the I like the concept. I think if I because I want to teach college. So I think I something like that sounds fun, but like you couldn't grade too hard. Like you couldn't be like too harshly, you know, grading. No, that. I I mean nobody really failed these things. It was more of just like it was teaching efforts. I mean, as long as you didn't totally botch the mm-hmm. thing, you were gonna be fine. Yeah. I was even thinking too, it would be kind of fun to do like, like breakup scenes. Like how do you break up with someone? How do you, or like ask for a raise from your boss? Like yeah. these are sp- like, these are speaking skills. that I think people, you know, who do speech class, like they're like, I don't have to ever give a speech again. That's not true. Your whole life is full of speeches. I mean, really even at the, the base, you know, ground level of it, ordering food at a restaurant's theoretically a speech. It's a short one, but it is one. Mm-hmm. You know what? You know what they should teach in speech class. The first, the first thing they should teach in speech class is telephone conversations. <laughs> I sound so crotchety and old saying that, but it's true. It really yeah. is. Like how to answer a telephone? Just how to like people are so afraid to call anymore. Myself yeah. included. I don't like calling people. No, neither do I. I don't like being called. Mm-hmm. I barely answer these Skype calls. 
I for- <laughs> you're like, oh God, it's Matt again. Jesus. <laughs> I, you know, I don't answer. If I don't have the phone number saved to my phone, I'm not answering that call. Do you do the no. same thing? I, I, well, actually I lie. I answer just about everything. I do. Um, okay. Because I don't want to, I don't, because what's worse to me personally is, so nine times out of 10, they're spam calls, whatever you just hang up on them. <laughs> but every once in a while, it's something that's legit and I have to call back and I don't want to call back. <laughs> you're right that's like the extra 10 minutes oh i gotta tell you the story and i want i want you to this is kind of speaking of communications so a few weeks ago this comedian friend requested me um the local comedian local one and yeah because you know that, that's Do I know the gig them? no i don't think you would um and i didn't really know them that well but i accepted because we were on a show together mm-hmm. and i'm hosting this show in akron i'm like substitute hosting next week and I messaged him on Facebook. I said, hey, do you want to come out? And he's like, no, I'm good. And then I realized, wait a minute, we're not friends anymore. And I was like, he unfriended me. Right after so then friending I, you? Like, literally, in the three weeks, like, three weeks ago, he friended me. And since then, he's unfriended me. And I reached out to a mutual friend, another comedian. And I was like, did this, like, is this weird? Like, blah, blah, He goes, same thing happened to me. He added, he re-added me months later and blah, blah, I was like, so this guy is like... What's his end game? What's he trying me? to do? Well, the th- the theory that me and my mutual compadre came up with is that the guy maybe feels like I didn't interact with him on Facebook enough. What like is that? I wasn't like liking his posts or something. Is that guy kind of bring off that aura like that you constantly I, have to interact with this stuff? B- before I realized I was unfriended, I did not realize that. Do you know but how many g- people I don't see on my feed that I'm friends with? Probably Here's like ninety percent of them. Here's the thing, 100%, A, A, that, I see the same 20 people on my Facebook feed, and that's part of the Facebook algorithm that I think sucks. You just say the same people. Mm -hmm. Two, I'm not on social media that much. And when I am, like, maybe I'll scroll a little bit, but I'm not going to scroll and see every single post from everybody. That's just not possible. And two, like, when have I ever given the impression that I don't support people? Like, I'm a huge advocate for, like, People doing projects and like local art and collaboration and supporting each other. So this whole thing threw me for a loop because honestly, like I think it really hit me because, you know, lately with a COVID winter, I've just been feeling like really socially deprived. I've been feeling like it's starting to hit me. And it really existentialist. Is. And it's like now I feel like I'm like, why does this guy unfriend me? It just seems so weird. But like I feel a little bit better after talking to a mutual friend and figuring out that I'm not an outlier. Right. But still so weird. How are shows, by the way? You said you've been doing st- some stand up, right? How has that been going around? Here? Really, there are not many people there. Um, what kind of size clubs do you do? Do you like, do, you do bigger ones? Do you do they're like you know, small bars? Smaller, meaty. They're like cute little places. Um, like the one actually that I'm hosting next week, it's at a veterans hall. Okay. So that's a bigger space. Yeah. But, but they're, you know, they're pretty casual. sparse. Yeah, sparsely they're pretty casual. Intended. Well, and honestly, like, I like doing stand-up. I don't think it's a strength of mine, to be honest with you, because I think I do better when I get to, like, piece together projects like sitcom podcasting and um, doing my music and stuff. Like, when I get time to, like, write and edit and there's, like, layers to it, whereas, like, stand-up, like, I don't know, I feel like the best people who do stand-up, they're, like, kind of quick. They they write these quick little one-liners and these little jokes, which I guess I can do, but I don't know. I just, but I I like doing stand-up. I don't Who's your favorite comedian? Locally or in general? Just in general. Top top one. I love... um, Because it gives me kind of a sense of your your style that you like. I mean, uh, there's so many good ones. Nathan from Nathan For You, I think is fan. I love his dry humor a lot. Um, I'm trying to think who I... The guy, I, I, I like, I get a lot of my humor, I guess, from, like, a lot of animated shows, too. So, like, Seth MacFarlane and, like, you know, written humor. So. I've only ever been to one stand-up show my entire life. Really? Just one? Just one? It was Dimitri Martin. I don't know if I know him. Oh, uh, he's the guy who does a lot of, like, the drawings, and he'll bring out his guitar. He's got that bowl cut, and he's got the big nose. Real mm. skinny. He's pretty no. big. You probably have seen it, at least seen his face. <laughs> I'm so bad with names. <laughs> if you Google him right now, just Google him on your phone right now. Just look at his face. Okay. You will. You will probably. It's Dimitri. Dimitri Martin. I'm on it. I like how we're live and just going for it. I hey, it is what it is, man. Honestly, but um, 
No, this 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 quarantine thing is starting to hit me hard too. I know you're saying that earlier before we started, but it's really getting there, man. Just think, it's it's almost been we're we're inching close on what ten months because I know Ohio went locked down in March, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. into March. So we got ten months under our belt of this. It's just. I feel like I've been struggling with friendship in general. I think because as way? you get older, you like shed your friends a little bit. You know, in college, yeah. you're like friends with everybody. You're all living together in like the same area of town. Twenty, and your twenties are, are nuts because you don't have any money. You barely have a place to live. <laughs> you don't have a career yet. It's just like the wildest time. And you're friends with everybody. And one thing I noticed when I turned thirty is like that's all kind of gone away, which is mm. sad to do. But, um, no, I get what you're saying. And I, I've come to the realization, like, you know, friends come in and out of our lives for different reasons. And, like, it's crazy. Like, I was even thinking about it today, about, like, a couple of friends. And I'm like, at the time when we were really close, I was like, this is going to be, like, a friend like a friend for life right here. And then things happen. Relationships happen. And, you know, job opportunities happen. And bada bing bada boom it's it's you you put it it's like a, it's almost like friendships are like a dvd collection and some friendships you watch the dvd all the time others you watch it a few times like for like and some in end up in the five dollar bins yeah and then they're you know they're for the most part they're all kept on the shelf like when, in a memory shelf this reminds me of when i was in in college and i was in a an abandoned college and Man, we were around each other 24-7. Obviously, we had school during the week. But on the weekends, we'd play at, like, seedy-ass bars all over Ohio. <laughs> we'd sleep in, like, like people's homes, like, dirty-ass homes. Just, you know, and it was just, like, the craziest times. And I, I remember we did this for, like, three years. And we thought, you know, we always thought, oh, this will never end, never end. And then all of a sudden, this person got a job in New York. This person got a job in London. This person got a job in Boston. And then it just kind of faded away. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, you know what's funny about that is that always bums me out every once in a while. You know that that crazy experience I had with the band, but um, and I'll never forget this. So uh, we Ohio and like everybody in the world officially went at like the pandemic was declared March 11th of 2020, mm-hmm. and I played with the band one last time March 10th, the day before. Like the whole thing went down. Wow. That was literally the last thing I did with like the big thing I did with friends was, was that one experience. And it's just weird that that was the last thing we've done <laughs> for like a year now. Like I haven't done, I haven't been to a restaurant since January. Like it's coming up in a year. Mm-hmm. I haven't been to, and the last one I went to was like some Mexican restaurant. Man, it's just weird. It's just yeah. weird. Well, I think you're in a, you're in a position where you have a young child. And so it really puts the pressure on like, being cavemen (laughs) like you don't want to you have such a young precious life whereas like me you know the works you know i went into work every single day i had no option like i didn't stay at home at all um yeah because you're essential (laughs) well i no i mean you really are quote quote essential essential. yeah how someone's got to do it is different i guess (laughs) but you know for me i feel like i've been this like half example because like you know I do stay at home a lot and I'm not doing much. I'm not doing anything. I'm not seeing any people and, but I still got to work, you know, I still got to do that. So it's, I I thought when, you know, all this quarantine was going to go down, I thought it was kind of nice that I would have some time to do some more creative outlets, but man, it, it, it's burned me out a little bit in this winter. You know, I have a break for about a month from, you know, this program I'm doing Mm -hmm. and it, it, it kind of, you know, makes me upset because I don't, I don't know if you feel the same way but we have all this time to do all this creative stuff and it's just it's like my mind is fried like i just can't get my head around it if that mm. makes sense you know yeah, that makes sense it's like the creative burnout yeah yeah i think for me it's kind of been like i had a lot of goals this year and i had to push them to next year and so i think for me creatively i feel like a little like I have an itch because like there's things that I just can't do. So like, I've been working a lot on the music. I've been working a lot on some like projects that I can do at home. Right. But like, I want to get back out there. I want to get back into the field. And 
Uh, I just want to. I I want to go to dirty dive bars again. I want to see. Yes. Like, I want to. I'm gonna like go to karaoke at some weird ass place in Lakewood again with you guys. Yes. And I want to stay up to like two a.m. and like go out I'm, till the bars gonna, close. And I'm gonna tell you when this when this vaccine hopefully you know calms everything down or whenever this goes away. The first thing I want to do is just do some weird ass wonky karaoke that bar in in downtown Lakewood. Man, we saw some characters. That is like. It's like a UN meeting at that place, man. And we, I, I love it. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Corky's is one of those bars. You know, actually, the best bar in Cleveland that has like an identity crisis, Tina's. It's this little Never place. It's this little, they do karaoke. It's uh, in Ohio City. The vibe's different every time. One night, it'll be like a trucker bar. One night, it's like a gay bar. One night, it's like millennials. It's insane. The it's just whoever of, like, shows up first that night. It's really like, yeah, the identity of the bar is always changing. I love those but, places. But I, I was going to say, I love those places. And because the thing about Corky's is it's just, it's just everybody. It's just mm-hmm. everybody. And I think that was one of my, like, I'll never forget watching that karaoke. It would go from like metal to like K-pop to country (laughs) like it was just all over the christmas songs it was just nuts Mm -hmm. and that was the kind of stuff because there was just so many characters and just oh man let's see that's the stuff i miss and i can't wait to get back to that i really can't it's gonna be funny because like you know before covid i'd be like oh i'm too tired or like i don't want i have you know i'm never gonna say that again for 5 a.m but yeah i think i'm at least for like the like for the first year post covid i'm gonna be like yeah, I mean, I'll do that, and I'll do this, and I don't know. We'll see. It'll be fun. We'll be, we'll get back together, and <laughs> you know, the good news is, and more some more good news. I filed the LLC paperwork today. I thought you were so gonna say the fired. <laughs> filed, my bad. Um, so the state of Ohio is probably gonna take a week or two to approve my paperwork, and fingers crossed, I'll be able to talk about it soon. Nice, and you'll have your own legitimate company. I know. It's, it'll be fun. Was I'm that excited. hard to do? I've never filed an LLC. Oh, it, it really was so easy. It it took like 10 minutes, not even, 100 bucks. Really? Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, I have there's this could be a whole other <laughs> podcast. I won't ask any more questions. I'll just leave it at that because I have too many. I really do. This I like is how mad money this, on CNBC. Yeah, this podcast today is like communications to existentialism to this person in front of me on Facebook to like LLC talk. Like I love it. I love Can it. Can we so bring much. up the grandfather paradox next episode? Oh my god, what is that? And you know what? I'll just I'll just uh, I'll bring it up now. Yeah, right, close us so, out. So this is the grandfather paradox. It's one of my favorite things to to bring up in like random conversations. And it okay, well, here's what it is is so you go back in time, okay? And it's it's how it kind of is explains parallel universes. So you go back in time, kill your grandfather, okay? <gasps> okay. In turn, he does not have your father. In turn, he does not have you. Therefore, you couldn't have gone back and killed your grandfather, so he exists. Ooh. But then you go back and kill your grandfather, and then which your dad doesn't exist, but then you didn't exist, so you didn't exist to kill your grandfather. So it's this endless loop of whether this thing can happen or not. And the thought about it is that things can actually split off into three different multiverses. Mm-hmm. So there can be one where you killed your grandfather and didn't at the same time. And it's basically just mm-hmm. if we believe that or not. If it's things like that can happen. I mean, theoretically, um, I was actually, I rewatched Futurama a few months ago and there's an episode where they travel, they travel back in time and they're in like the 1940s. Long story short, Fry's grandfather is around and Fry gets worried that like his grandfather is going to die. And so while protecting his grandfather, the grandfather accidentally dies. And so Fry ends up having sex with his grandmother in order to be alive in the future. And it's just so, it, it's just so interesting. Cause it's like, I don't know. Like, would that genuinely work? Like, do you believe in the mo- in infinite universes? I, I kind of do. And I think that sometimes I wish I was in a different one. <laughs> Cause I feel like I'm in my <laughs> universes, like, like talented, but not like, like, always going to be underrated, which I don't mind, but like, I feel like there's a, uni- a couple universes out there where like, you know, not like I'm Joe Rogan, but like, I'm like, you know, maybe like 
B level it's, or something. It's like that uh, that phrase. It's like there's a, there's an infinite amount of universes somehow I ended up in this shitty one. Right. <laughs> I feel like I'm in an okay one. I feel like I could be in, like, there, I'm trying to think of, like, universes. Like, if there's, like, a universe where I sold out and, like, went to work in, like, corporate management or something, like, oof, that sounds bad. Or, like, I don't know, a universe where, like, I'm, like, on the streets or something. I don't know. So, like, I feel like I'm definitely in a <laughs> way, better way to than be some. <laughs> way to cheer us up at the end. I'm such an optimistic person. At least I'm not like, homeless not too in this bad. one. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, it's been a good time. I'm so glad to see you. Yes, and hopefully uh, we'll get a little bit better of a world view, You'll, you know, next time we record with everything going on. So we'll see. Yeah. It's, it's always an adventure. Absolutely. All right. Well, until next time, peace Later. out.